All right. Hey, welcome to Discovery Church. So glad you're here today. Let me welcome everyone who's joining us online, those of you in our outdoor courtyard and our Northwest campus. Come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house and listening to the word today. <laughs> Amen. We're in this series, Dream to Destiny. And here's what we, again, this is one of my joys, you guys, as a pastor, is to take people on this journey. People that are far away from God, for them to get this revelation that Jesus is Lord of all, but that not being like the end of the journey. It's the beginning of this amazing journey to discover God's destiny. Like you were created, everybody was created with a God-defined destiny in our lives. But in order to achieve that destiny, we have to develop like the inner fortitude. We got to go through some transformation because we can't carry the weight of the destiny God has called us to immediately. God's got to take us through a process to build our character and our faith and our inner life. And that's why God takes us through these character tests to prepare us. The only reason that you wouldn't fulfill the destiny God has on your life is because your character isn't big enough to sustain it. It's not because they did this and I didn't get that. None of that has anything to do with you being who God has called you to be and doing what God has called you to do. Nobody can thwart the plans of God for your life. Only you can. Are you hearing me, church? So God's got to take us through a process to develop our character. And we're studying the life of Joseph in this series because God takes Joseph through 10 tests to refine his character for this amazing big destiny he had for him, but we have to go through, no matter the size of your destiny, you have to go through the same character building tests uh, if you want to achieve your God-given destiny. The, the test that we're going to cover today is the prison test. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Robert did an amazing job a few weeks ago before Father's Day um, about the purity test, and, and he, we, we ended off this story where Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, and we see Joseph, he does the right thing, right? He, he runs away, but, but she grasps for him and, and holds on to his cloak. Let's go into Genesis chapter 39. I'm going to back up all the way to verse 11. Didn't have enough room to put it in your guys' notes, but it'll be on the screen with you to give you the context. We're going to read a lot of the scripture today, and then we're going to dig in and study what God has to say about this, this prison test and what he's trying to develop inside of us through it. Genesis chapter 39, starting at verse 11. One day, Joseph went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants were inside. She, that's Potiphar's wife there, caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants and said, look, she said to him, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master, that's his, her, her husband, came home. And, and, and she told him the same story. The Hebrew slave you brought us came to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, now again, this was a fabricate, this is a lie. This came from the enemy, okay? This was, the enemy is a liar and the father of lies. This was a lie, a fabrication of the reality. When the master heard this fabricated story, um, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him uh, and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. They're talking about the prison test here. Here Joseph is, again, he has to uh, suffer some consequences that undeserved now, and he's in, in prison. And so it says that what Joseph, uh, while Joseph was in prison, the Lord was with him there, even there in the darkness of that prison, even while he's suffering God is still with him there, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all, all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. We see that Joseph has some character or faith that, that he's able to, even in the prison, rise to like the second in command. Joseph, though, fi finds himself again at another setback to the destiny. He, he's got a dream from God. He knows he's called to something. And, and, and here he is, another setback 
to the dream, to him fulfilling his destiny. But it's not really the trial or the setback. That's not the problem. We're discovering that it's how we respond to the trial, and it's how Joseph responds to this prison test right here that we're going to talk about that actually sets him up for his destiny. And the prison test, listen to me, the prison test is all about perseverance. That's what this is about. It is, it's talking about God developing character in our lives through things that we go through, persevering through difficult seasons. Look at Romans chapter 5 with me. I want to show you this, that what the Bible gives as really a formula to producing character. We've talked a lot about character in this series, but there is actually, in Romans chapter 5, we see a very clear process of how God actually develops character in our life. Let me show it to you, Romans chapter 5. Look at it. It says, and not only that, but we also glory in our tribulations. That word glory in Greek there literally means to rejoice. Some of your translations may say rejoice in our tribulations. But if you look at the root word of that, that Greek word rejoice, it actually has the root to wish or to pray. So what he's saying here is like, we rejoice, we wish and we pray for tribulation. We glory in them. Why in the world would anyone do that? Here's why. Look what he says. Knowing that oh we know something something is behind this there's something else that god is doing in the i'm not going to get caught up in the problem in and of itself i can rejoice in the tribulation because i know something that other people don't know i know god's producing something through this thing knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. Now I want you to see you guys here. This is a process of how God develops us and in a formula really. And let me just show you, I'll break it down for you of what God is trying to do through your prison tests. And I guarantee you, every single person in here, you're going through tribulation because you're on earth. It's going to happen, okay? So let me, show, let me break down this, this, this scripture so you can see what God is trying to produce. So you can know the same thing Joseph did and respond to your prison differently. Are you with me, you guys? You can respond to the tribulation differently. So here's the first thing this scripture was just telling us. Tribulation produces perseverance. Write that down. Tribulation produces perseverance. I just took that right out of the word, you guys. Tribulation produces per perseverance. Now let me explain something to you. You don't have to wish for or pray for tribulation. It's going to happen. No one needs to be like, God, give me tribulation. No, you don't need to do that, okay? It's just, it's going to happen. It's life. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I've overcome the world. It says that we rejoice in our tribulation. Some translation says rejoice in our suffering. Another similar verse in James chapter 1, you might be familiar with, verse 2 and 3. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials, and then he says of many kinds, there's just not some trials God will use. No, God's using this kind of trial. I can see how God can use this. And, but no, he says many kinds. Even when the enemy's out to get you, God can use that trial for your good. Even when you've been accused and undeservedly punishing, like Joseph is getting punished for something he didn't deserve, God can use those trials as well of many kinds. Because you know something. Again, there it is. You know something here that regular people, other people don't know. You know that the testing of your faith produces what? This is all throughout the Bible. This is, it produces perseverance. Not very many people enjoy tests. But you cannot go to school without taking tests. Because tests reveal something, don't they? They reveal if you need to redo the material. Are you ready to go on to the next grade? Okay, and God is very interested in, in taking you on the journey of, of developing you and growing you up and maturing you and getting you on to the next grade. So what does he do to that? He wants to make sure that you're ready for it. So he gives us these tests to make sure. Do, does he need to redo this? Do we need to go over this again? Or is he ready for what's next that I have for him? You have to be able to realize what's really going on in the, te in the test. It's producing something. It's literally cooking something it's crafting something and i think a lot of times the problem itself it hijacks the learning experience that god intends for it we get so focused and 
fixated on the actual problem, on the actual issue, but I promise you, I'm telling you this, tucked away in that problem is a lesson God's trying to teach you. Tucked away in your financial troubles, I'm telling you there's a lesson in there that the Holy Spirit's trying. Tucked away in the marriage struggle, tucked away in your relationship, tucked away in that stuff, I promise you, you're getting so fixated on the problem, but behind that, God's producing something through that tribulation. He's working, he's cooking, he's crafting something inside of you. You almost have to get over the distraction of that bad place and circumstance, the the bad circumstance of your prison, so you can learn the lesson. The test is developing something inside you called perseverance. Let me say it this way. Every tribulation that you go through, God is trying to develop this quality inside of you. Every one of them. Every tribulation you go through, God is trying to develop perseverance inside of you. What does perseverance mean? Perseverance is patient endurance through long and difficult trials. Or, or it's, it's also called staying power. To stick with it, to stick it out, to not give up, to have grit and continuance, to persevere. I'm not going to stop or quit. It's the ability to go through that junk. And I'm telling you, God is going to allow some things to happen in your life. And you try to run from the very things that God is trying to use to develop you. Sometimes I think we pray, we're like, God, get me out of this. Help me, Lord. And God, I think up in it, he's going, open your eyes, I'm using it. Wake, no, 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 I'm not going to get you out of this. This is the very thing I put you in to develop something inside of you. Stop looking at it and start looking for me through it. Which leads to this next step, you guys. God's more interested in your character than in your comfort, in your holiness than your happiness. So, so here's, here's the formula. Look, I'm, I'm going to break down what God's doing in, in the prison, in the tribulation. Tribulation, all tribulation, God's trying to produce perseverance perseverance produces character again right out of the scripture i looked up character throughout the entire bible and anything that had like inner heart or fortitude all throughout the scriptures every place is in the bible and i found no place in the entire scripture that develops character the only thing that develops character mentioned in the scriptures is you have to persevere You have to patiently endure difficult seasons and circumstances with the grit of staying power if you want to get character. Joseph endured 13 years. David endured 13 years. Uh, Moses was 40 years in development. Some Israelites never achieved the promised land. They never got to their destiny. See, it's how you like... How you handle or how you react and respond to the tribulation, to the prison test, will determine if you even walk into your destiny at all. To patiently endure. It's right out of Romans chapter 5. Listen, one of the, one of the things, if you have authority in this room, if you're someone who's a boss or a parent or anything like that, the worst thing you can do is promote someone before they're ready. It's the worst thing, man. Or deliver them out of a trial that God has taken them through to work out character in their life. That's why you got a whole bunch of kids, uh, adults now, that don't have any characters because parents did not let them go through the perseverance and the testing. They rescued them and bailed them out, and now they have no character as adults. Okay? So the worst thing you do, if you have authority in this room, the worst thing you can do is come to somebody's rescue instead of letting God do what he's supposed to do inside of them. Okay? Uh, And here we see this all throughout Scripture. We see perseverance works character in our life, and Joseph was a man of great ability. And, and everywhere he goes, he rises to the number two person. Whether it's Potiphar's house, it's the prison, it's, it's Pharaoh's house. The Bible says every time, they didn't have to look for anything under Joseph's care. So obviously, he's a man of great ability, but was it his ability or was it God's favor that produced it? That's what we have to understand. I think that Joseph prolonged his period in the prison just a little bit. Let me read you a scripture. If you remember the, uh, the story, the baker and the butler had of a dream. And Joseph interprets the dream, and, and, he, and he interprets the dream for the baker first, and he says, he says in three days, um, you're going to die. Your head's getting cut off. How about that for a prophetic word? You know what I mean? He's like, you're dead. And then to the, to the butler, he's like, hey, in three days, you're actually going to be raised up, and you're going to go back to being the butler for, for Pharaoh. Then he says to the butler in Genesis chapter 40, look at this. He says, but when all goes well with you, I highlight it every time Joseph says, me, me. Remember me and show me 
kindness. Mention me. Drop, drop a hint for me. Drop my name in the guy's mouth, man, to get me out of this prison because I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. I didn't deserve that when I got sold into slavery. And even now, here where I'm at, I've done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. I wasn't wrong then. I'm not wrong now. Mention me. He's dropping, drop my name. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. And the butler goes, oh yeah, wait a second. I know a guy who interprets dreams. Okay? So who, who gave Pharaoh the dream? God did. Why didn't God give Pharaoh the dream two days later? Why did he wait two years later? You ever think about that? Could it be that here Joseph is in the middle of his dungeon and his prison experience, in the middle of his tribulation, he's still being outward focused and he's, he's ministering to other people. He's interpreting and serving them and, and, and loving on them. He's, and God's looking at him going, oh, that's my kid, man. Good job, Joseph. You, and, and, and then he, and God's about to step in and then Joseph goes, hey, let me drop a hint though. Can, can, you, can you put my name in his mouth and remember me and, and get me out of here because I don't deserve it? And I just see God going like, oh, not ready. Because if I rescue him now, he's going to think to get ahead, uh, all I got to do is drop hints. Let me tell you something. Listen, listen to me. God never, never rewards manipulation. Never. I, I, I don't know how many times I've been... It, Almost ready to promote somebody, to bless somebody, to, act, to, to, to just lift somebody. And, and then they drop a hint. And then they, they try to manipulate me or the situation. And I go, ooh, thank you, Lord. Not, they're not ready. They're not ready. I, I, I think God waits two years instead of two days to... To build character inside that's going to support the destiny. It's God's grace that he doesn't put you in the destiny before you're ready to fulfill it. Because if he did, you'd fall. And Joseph, I believe, would have fell. He's waiting on your character to be big enough to support your destiny. And every time you manipulate people and you manipulate situations to get your way, I think God goes, oh, not ready. They're going to have to endure this for a little bit longer now. Because... Because we're failing the test. He's like, ah, they got to redo this. Let's redo this. I can't, I can't get them out of here yet and give it to them because they're not, they're not ready to carry this yet. So tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Now back to Romans 5. What does character produce? Look at it. Character, write it down, produces hope. All right, right out of Romans 5. I'm not making this stuff up, you guys. Let me, let me tell you something about character. Character isn't just how you act. Oh, someone's going to act right. You know, they have good character. Of course, yes. But character is not just how you act. It's how you react. That's, that's character. Joseph did the right thing and suffered the wrong consequences. I don't know if that's ever happened to you that, you, that you suffer the wrong consequences for making the right decisions, for standing up for what was right. By the way, have you ever thought about this? What was the evidence that got him thrown away this time? Remember, okay, in an earlier message, we talked about the fabricated evidence that, that his brothers use to actually support the lie that he was devoured by wild animals. You remember what they used? They used his coat, right? They used his ripped up coat with the blood. And so, so now, let me just show you, because the enemy's got no new tricks, right? He's, he's the same. He's got no new tricks. He's a liar. The thing that, what does he use again in this situation to get to support a fabricated lie to get him thrown into prison? What does he use? His coat, if I was Joseph, I'd never put on another coat in my life. I'd be like, I'm done with coats. Get the coat. It could be two degrees outside. They're like, here's a coat. I'm like, no, get that away from me. Get behind me, Satan. I will not wear another coat in my life. I know it's, it's funny connection, but I want to I show you that, that the, the way that he's not creative, Satan's not creative, the way that he tripped you up last time, he's coming at you again with the same thing. It's the same tactics he's used. So whatever he, he used to fabricate evidence to, for you to bite on that hook or that lure, I don't know what it is for you. If it is like the, a couple weeks ago we talked about lust and that secret of lust and stuff. Get, if that's it, I'm telling you, he's coming at you again through the same door. He's going to put some safeguards, put some, some, some safeguards on your internet or something. Just 
you got to understand, he's not creative. He's coming at you again. What is it that Satan is using to keep tripping you up? Proverbs 13 and 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. Now, the hope he's talking about here isn't a hope in God. He's talking about a misplaced hope. It actually makes your heart sick when you put your hope in the wrong things. If you put your hope in your circumstances changing, your heart's going to get sick. You don't put your hope in circumstances changing. Our hope is put in God. Now listen to me. For the most part, other than a few slip-ups, Joseph kept his heart right before God. Hope is not that God will deliver you from your circumstances. Do you know that? That's not hope. Hope is that God will help you walk through your circumstances. That's what hope is. Our hope is in God, not in our circumstances changing. Because if your hope is in your circumstances changing, the longer they don't change, the more your heart gets sick. So, so we see here that character is producing this hope inside of us for a very specific, very important reason. Let me show it to you. This is what the scripture says. What's the next thing? What is hope producing then? Hope produces divine appointments. Let me show it to you in Romans chapter 5, okay? Let me just, it says, remember, tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And then he says this, now hope does not disappoint. For those of you that know grammar in here, or, or you like English, you know that's a double negative, correct? You see that? Not and disappoint. They cancel each other out. I'm seeing eyes glaze over. I'll be quick. Okay, I'm sorry. Look, so what it's basically saying, not disappoint, those are two negatives. What it's basically saying is hope appoints. That's, that's what this word is saying. When I say that hope produces divine appointments, listen to me carefully. I know you're going through tribulation because we all are. We're all in the world. Jesus said in this world you will have tribulation. So we're all going through some form of tribulation. That tribulation will produce perseverance in our lives. That perseverance, if we respond correctly, will produce character. That character will produce hope. And hope, listen to me, hope will produce divine appointments for us to step into our destiny. This is what God is trying to do. Why we go through tribulation. Why we need to persevere. Why perseverance is the only thing that develops character. Because character is the only thing that can actually hold hope. And it's hope that opens doors of opportunity for you. That's what you just saw in scripture. Right there. Because here Joseph is in prison. And he interprets the dreams of the butler and the baker. What that shows me is he didn't have a sick heart. He was still in, his, in that prison suffering through tribulation, and he was still looking for other people to be used by God. His heart was ready and willing and able to be used by God. Look what it says in Genesis chapter 40. When Joseph came to them the next morning, the, the butler and the baker, he saw that they were sad, they were dejected. And he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look sad today? See, because Joseph still had hope in his life, it was, it was that hope that produced the divine appointment. If he was not, if he did not step into that moment to be used by God and interpret the dreams, he would have never achieved his destiny. Are you guys seeing this, okay? That disappointment some of you are experiencing with your circumstance, with your life, with whatever tribulation you're going through, is a lie of the enemy. You are to be disappointed. What you are believing in that, in that position of your disappointment, hear me please, in your position of disappointment, you are believing you missed the appointment. The enemy has convinced you that you missed the appointment of God. And that is a lie from the devil. That is a lie. You did not miss the appointment. You're actually, he's getting you out of the posture that could only produce the divine appointment. It is hope, hope alone, that can produce divine appointments. You look at other people, and they're going through the same thing. Everyone's going through tribulation. We all going through life. But other people are going through it with a different attitude. They're going through it with a different heart. They're going through it with a different posture. And you see them get blessed, and you see other people get open doors, and you're like, where's my open door? Could it be that it's your mindset is preventing you? 
Could it be the very disappointment that you bought into is preventing you from walking into the appointment God had for you? Are you all with me today, you guys? Our hope. You go through those. If Joseph looked at his circumstances, right, if he got caught there in the prison and it's not, it's undeserved, he would have lost all hope. We all would. We, we, we could, we could all, if we listen to the devil whispering in our ear in the middle of our tribulation, throwing the towel, just give up. It's never going to work. You're never going to get there. Maybe that dream wasn't, wasn't for you. We, we would all lose hope. But listen to me, our hope is not in those things. Our security is not in our job. Jobs come and go. Right? Our security isn't in money because money is going to float away. Our hope isn't even in ourselves because we cannot bail ourselves out. Our hope is not in what we have or what we can produce. Our hope is in God and in what He can produce when we trust in Him. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 tells us about hope. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. And that's what keeps us firm and secure. When the waves of the ocean are beating you and hitting you and you're going through tribulation and suffering, it is hope that anchors you, that keeps you able to stand and persevere, that, that God's not finished with me yet there are some of you here today that are going through tribulation like every we're all going through some form you're going through the tribulation but you're going through it without hope and because of that you're going to miss the appointment so let me give you some hope anchors today let me just let me let, if i could just i want to give you some anchors of hope for your soul to be firm and secure because you need hope. Hope is what gets you to, to the divine appointment, okay? So let me give you a few of them, maybe I think four of them. We'll see. Number one is this. Here's your first hope anchor. God is there. Hey, right in the prison, right in your tribulation, right in your suffering, right there. I want you to believe this. This is hope that is an anchor for your soul. God is there. The first thing that the enemy is going to do in your prison and in your suffering is tell you you're alone. You're all alone. God has abandoned you. I mean, listen to me. You are not alone. It's not true. That's a lie. In fact, God is omnipotent. He is everywhere at all times. He is always there, even when he feels far away, even when you, you're suffering from undeserved things and things you did deserve. It's the mistake you made. You've ran far away. God is still there. He's always there. You cannot run from God. Psalm 139 says this, where can I go from your spirit, God? Where can I flee from your presence, if I go up to the heavens, of course you're there. But even if I make my bed in the depths, the word is Sheol or hell, you are there even when I'm experiencing hell in my life. I can't, you're there, God. The Bible promises he will never leave you nor forsake you. He sees everything because he's there. Hebrews 4.13 says, he knows about everyone everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. This is an anchor for your soul. And I want to add something to this because I know that God anchors our hope, but I feel like I need to tell you today that not only God is there, but people are too. Because what the enemy will try to do in the middle of your tribulation, in the middle of that prison test, he's trying to isolate you from hope from God and help from people. Both of those things, he's trying to, he's trying to isolate you. And we even think things... Um, and, and, and like, oh, nobody's here for me. We go through tough times. Nobody's here for me. Nobody cares. And, and he didn't call me. And she didn't reach out to me. I've seen it, man. People isolate themselves because a thought the enemy placed in their mind. And they fabricates evidence. Like, did you see what she did? Did you see how she looked at you? Yeah. Has the enemy ever lied to you like that? Yeah. They didn't call. Oh, you know why they didn't call? Because they don't love you. I'm telling you, this is, a, this is a lie of the enemy. People are here for you that love you. Not only is God there, but people are there too. God is there. It's an anchor for your soul. Here's the second anchor that you need in the middle of your prison, in the middle of the tribulation. God is never late. You got to believe this. It'll anchor your soul firm and secure. God is always on time. He may appear to be late, 
but he's not. Be patient with God. And by the way, be patient with yourself too. One of life's greatest frustrations is that our timetable is very rarely God's timetable because we're in a hurry, but God is never in a hurry. You realize that, right? God is never in a rush. He's never in a hurry. When God wants to create an oak, he takes hundreds of years. When God wants to create a fungus mushroom, he does it overnight. See, great, great souls, great character is grown from the struggles and the storms of seasons of suffering. Be patient with the process. There is no other. You guys, got, God is famous for his midnight rescues, his last minute recoveries. It's how he works. Acts chapter 16 tells us of a story where Paul and Silas were going through a prison test themselves. In the New Testament, they were wrongly accused and suffering and in the prison. It says this, about midnight, can't it get any darker than this? It's the darkest of dark in their situation. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were just listening. They didn't join in on the singing. They were just listening. Paul and Silas were praying and praising. They must have sounded crazy, but they knew something about their tribulation that these other guys didn't know. They were taking glory in their suffering because they knew God was cooking something, that God was crafting and producing something, that they were singing and praising God. And suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. And at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Listen, praise transports us into the realm of the supernatural and into the power of God. I didn't put it in your notes, but Psalm 89 and 15 says this. Blessed are the people who know the joyful shout. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your presence. Oh, the shout of praise. See, when you don't know that God is with you, or when you do know that God is with you, that he'll never leave you, never forsake you, that he's never late, his timing is perfect, you can praise God no matter where you're at, even in prison. You get a bad diagnosis from the doctor, God, you are my healer. You don't have enough to pay the bills? God, you're my provider. You feel like you have no hope? God, you're the lifter of my head. See, when you engage with God this way, you, you form a spiritual connection with God. It acts as this conduit from heaven to earth where God's power can be activated in our life. And then when you shout praises, it becomes a clarion call to the enemy that God is here and Satan has no more power over me. Out of praise comes breakthrough. Strongholds are broken, we see. Chains fall off our lives. Real joy takes root in us and brings us a peace that nothing in the world can compare to. We live glory to glory, breakthrough to breakthrough, blessing to blessing. What gets us through the prison test is praise. That God is never late. It's an anchor for your soul. God is here. God is never late. Here's the third anchor. God knows best. This is an anchor for your soul. It'll keep you in hope, and hope will, will give you divine appointments. There's a God knows best. There's a lot of answered prayers in the Bible where people got answered prayers and a lot of miracles that we see in the scriptures. But if you read the scriptures, you also see that there's a lot of unanswered prayers. There's a lot of miracles that didn't happen on this side of heaven. And in those situations, too, God knows best. I remember when, years ago, when I was a bivocational pastor, meaning I, I was working a job in, in ministry as like an associate pastor. We knew, Veronica and I knew that the Lord would call us into full-time ministry eventually, but we weren't rushing it, but just knew in our spirit that that was, that was coming. And I had told God, I don't know if you ever told God anything, like you've given him like an ultimatum, like, this is what I want, God. Doesn't, I don't recommend it. But I told, I told God, I'm like, okay, God, I'm, I'm all in. I'm yours. When you say go, I'll, I'll go. But I'm asking for one thing. Give me a house for my family. I want a home, God. I want to provide a home. I want my children to have a stable home. I don't, I, just give us a home. I want to be able to provide a home for my children and my family. And I was working as an executive, and, and we're making good money, and, like, we're putting in, like, offers at, at 
and they're going, falling through escrow. We get an escrow and fall through, fall through. And I'm like, okay, come, okay, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. And then the call comes for me to take the leap. And we're still renters. And I'll be honest with you, it was, it was hard for me. It was, uh, I, felt like, I felt like less of a man, less of a provider. And I was a little bit mad at God at first. I was like, God, I'm all in. And I just, uh, I'll do whatever, go where I, it's just what I, one thing I ask for, Lord. And, of course, I got to this place that, you know, Pastor Veronica and myself, but God knows. God knows best. Okay, God. And we took the, the, the leap and like a 50% pay cut. And, and we're like, well, it ain't going to happen then. It ain't going to happen now. It's just, but God, God knows. It was actually back in, way back when the first housing crash happened, the market. And, um, and so we took that step, market crashes. Nine months later, we walk into a brand new home that we bought for $99,000. Okay. So and here I, like, I just, and I, we walk into that home, we're thinking, wow, God, we, I was like begging him, like, God, please give me this house, this is the one, God, this is the one, and, and God was like, you don't know, no, 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 listen, son, I know you want that, but it's not what's best, I can't, I'm so grateful for the unanswered prayers in my life, I am grateful for when God said, not yet, you don't know, you don't know, that's not for you, she's not for you, that ain't her, that's not the home. Uh uh. That's not the one. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know what. I, if, I can't imagine, man, if I would actually got into one of those homes, I was, because they were crazy, you guys. And if I would have gotten to one of those homes and been so upside down in the financial strain that would have put on my, my early marriage and my early family and in our early ministry, I don't know if I'd be who I am today or where I am today if I would have had to endure that that trial i don't know if i would but god knew god knew my character can't handle that one no 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 kid you can't handle that one i'm not giving you that no i'm thankful i'm grateful that god knows best this is an anchor for my soul it's an anchor even when it doesn't go the way that i thought it would go no 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 god you know best john chapter 9 verse 1 through 7 it talks about this guy who was actually um, born blind it says, as Jesus went along, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened. This blindness, this tribulation and suffering in this guy's life happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. God was producing something inside of this man before he was ever born that he would go through this trial to produce something the glory of god would be revealed in his life after saying this jesus spit on the ground made some mud with the saliva and put it in the man's eyes what a weird way to heal somebody but he never did that again right but he he's smears it in his eyes and he goes go he told them wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent so the men went and washed and then it says he came home seen and when you look at that that phrase came home seen in the Greek it actually means that as he went home he was being healed that's the verb tense that's being used there as he went home he was being healed and I think about this man who was born blind and as he's just, Jesus told me to go home, here I go, I'm still, he's just got just jacked up eyes. But with every step, his, his vision is coming back, and coming back a little bit, and then a little bit blurry, and then muddy vision, trusting God, following his word, trusting his promise, as he goes, he's being healed. I love what Isaiah 55 says. God says, this plan of mine is not what you would work out. Of course it's not. We would love to see just everything go smooth and easy. God goes, this, this plan of mine, though, what I have for you, it's not what you would work out for yourself. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, I've just decided, you guys, to accept that God's will and my plan for my life, I just accept it. God, you'll work it out how you see fit. I surrender control, which, in fact, I never had control. If you think you have control, you're fooling yourself. Control is illusion. You have no control. This is an anchor for your soul to say, you know what? I don't have control. God, you know best. 
God is there. He's never late. He knows best. And lastly, and then I'm going to give you this in the scripture, and then I'm going to pray for you. Write it down as an anchor for your soul. Number four, God cares. He cares. As much as I love you as your pastor, and as much as I pray for you, and as much as you love your kids and your children, listen to me, God cares for you more. James chapter 5, verse 11. It says, you've heard, of course, of Job's staying power. That word is perseverance. Staying power, his perseverance. And you know how God brought it all together for him at the end. That's because God cares. Right down to the last detail, God cares for you. Look, every single one of us are going through tribulation. We all have to go through the prison test. But are you going through it the way that God wants you to go through it? Are you, is it developing in you perseverance or complaining and criticism? Because the whole reason why we're going through the tribulation, God wants to develop perseverance in you, staying power through the difficult seasons and suffering so that character is developed inside of you. Some of you are here today and you're disappointed. You are. You've you've even told other people. You've told yourself. You've told God that you're disappointed. It's a lie of the enemy to keep you from the divine appointment. To keep your, your heart in a place of hope. In a place of anchored. In, in that place of anchored hope that actually produces divine appointments. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.